far on the left, it, this is the paper, I think. Well, so um, this is a measurement of the clustering of galaxies throughout cosmic time where we can see galaxies and combined with other cosmological data sets, this very recent paper suggests that maybe, just maybe, this thing that we have measured and interpreted as a cosmological constant is maybe not even exactly a constant. Maybe there is a time evolution. I will write it as a question. Is there time evolution, evolution d by dt of this thing that uh, I called rho lambda, not zero. So this is an experimental question. You can ask, let's parameterize rho lambda with some non-trivial equation of state. Let's have it evolve in time. And then you can go and try to measure it. And that's what these people have done, among other things. And again, there are debates, and it's not, uh, it's not obvious what the answer is. If there is a hint for time evolution of rho lambda, it is um, not conclusive at this point. Statistically or systematically, it's not very significant. Somewhere between two and maybe four sigma, depending who you ask and how you combine the data. But there are, there are these questions, okay? So the field is interesting. And um, then take my lecture as, a, as an indication of just how crucially important it is to make these measurements and make them correctly. Okay, but regardless of the, the details of these debates, nobody is really debating, you know, the ballpark of the measurement. Nobody is today saying rho lambda is zero at the, at the time of speaking to you. It was measured fairly well. Maybe there is some corrections to the picture we have, but it's in the ballpark of this. And, uh, and then the question I ended up with is, what is the particle physics point of view of this number for vacuum energy density? And I suggest we look at it um, in different ways. The first point will be a classical perspective. The second will be quantum mechanical. And the third will be in terms of uh, early universe, let's call it. And this is a name, symmetry restoration. That's the aspect of early universe physics that I would like to discuss, and uh, hopefully I'll get there um, at some point. Great, so that's what we want to we wanna look at. So we want to do particle physics first at the classical level. What I will do, I will just discuss a toy model to start. Generalizing it to the full standard model and beyond is technically quite straightforward. So the classical picture, let's consider a toy model. It's a toy model, essentially, of the standard model Higgs sector that you will learn more about in, in following lectures by Christoph and others here. So the toy model is a single, real, massive scalar field with Lagrangian that you saw um, in, in recent lectures. Lagrangian density, which would look like this. And let us take a simple potential, again, a toy model of the standard model. So in our potential V of phi, let me call this V0 of phi for reasons that will become clearer later. Let's have this as a half m squared phi squared plus lambda over 4, phi to the 4. So this is an interacting single real massive scalar field. It would solve a Klein-Gordon equation that you can write down easily. Um, what else do I want to say about it? So this is our toy model. This Lagrangian density, or this model, has a Z2 symmetry. That is, you can see the Lagrangian is invariant to changing the sign of the scalar field. In the actual scalar model, in the actual standard model, the, the um, analog of this phi would be the Higgs 2 doublet, so analog. The Higgs, which is a doublet of SU2 and a singlet um, of, uh, and the hypercharge half representation of um, uh, U1 hypercharge in the standard model. And there, we will have a very similar kind of Lagrangian, but it's the absolute value here 
of this scalar doublet, the Higgs in the standard model, and then uh, the symmetry is a larger one. In this case, it's an SU2 cross U1 gauge redundancy, in fact. It's a gauge invariance. This is just a Z2 symmetry. Good enough for us. And now nature has been, uh, yes? Sorry, I didn't understand. Are you considering kind of a, a, a doublet plus a singlet? No, or no, no, no. Just no, a doublet no. with that no. hypercharge? I am simply considering in everything I will calculate. Uh -huh. I will just consider, uh, later I will extend a little bit, but in, in these calculations now, this is just um, a real singlet. Well, I did not introduce any gauge invariances or anything here, so this is okay. just a real massive scalar field. That's all there is to it. That's all we have to think about right now. All I said was, you can think on this potential as an anal analogy to the standard model Higgs sector, where you would promote, you know, phi squared, you'll put in absolute value squared, yeah. and you would need to think about um, internal indices for SU2 cos U1. That's all I said. Okay. I said it's a, it's, a, it's a toy model of the standard model. Great. Thank you. Okay. And uh, as in the standard model, nature has been um, having fun with us. So nature has chosen the mass of m squared to be negative. So this is a real parameter. It's a real scalar field. But this real parameter happens to be negative. That's very amusing. So we can plot this potential. right? So if, if I plot this potential, v0 as a function of phi, there is a z2, so it's enough for me to consider the positive side of phi. And then this potential looks something like this. And we'll explain it. We'll discuss it a little bit more. In fact, let me do something else. So that, that is kind of a minimal version of the potential, but why don't I just add, and if you're writing, add in your notes, a constant. Quantum field theory doesn't tell you anything about this constant. Why not? I can edit there, and in principle, I should. So as a function of phi, this is what you have. You have a quartic polynomial. And the fact that m squared is negative is seen in the fact that if you look at uh, the, behavior, the behavior of the potential very near to the origin, very near to phi close to 0, you can neglect this phi to the 4. You only have the m squared phi squared. And you see, this is a parabola that falls down like that. So you see the fact that m squared is negative. Great. So nature chose that. In principle, she didn't have to, <laughs> right? But she did. She could choose any signs she wanted, but uh, it, we have the negative one. Fantastic. So obviously, the minimum of this potential, where we can do particle physics, lives around here, at this point. So as I said, we don't know. QFT, quantum field theory, does not predict any of the couplings of the parameters that are in this theory it does not predict m squared, it does not predict lambda, and it does not predict this constant c. Right? Quantum field theory does a lot of things. It allows you to calculate scattering of particles, to do amazing things at accelerators and colliders and whatnot, and to understand many dynamical processes, but it has parameters that it doesn't predict. We have to measure them, and in this theory there are three, so m squared, lambda, and c. Three parameters. Neither of them is measured. However, in the standard model analog of this simple picture, we've measured all of these parameters. And now, to make contact with our rho lambda, where is this classical field theory um, um, makes contact with our rho lambda? Well, we live somewhere around here. Let's call the place we live in, let's call it phi c. Phi c is the place where d v0 by d phi at phi c is equal to zero, right? That's the minimum um, around which I, I can calculate. And so the potential is just the energy density. The quantum field theory potential is just the energy density for a theory where the field is static and homogeneous. The field isn't going anywhere. The Higgs field in the standard model is sitting around its vacuum expectation value. Yes, occasionally we give it a hit to this field, the DLHC, and we make some Higgs particles that form and decay immediately. But apart from the Higgs particles that are small oscillations around the minimum, the Higgs field is stuck at a point. Uh, Christoph will, I think, discuss it tomorrow. So it's stuck at a point, then the kinetic part of the Lagrangian doesn't contribute, and the energy density from this configuration that's stuck at the point is just coming from the potential.
so this theory says that rho lambda is just equal to the potential V0 at Vc, which is, right, half m squared Vc squared. And this object just happens to be 10 to the minus 47 GV to the 4. Awesome. Let's calculate what the thing on the right is. We can't predict it, but it has been measured. So the first thing to ask ourselves is, let's calibrate these parameters. Well, we know what phi c is. In fact, in the standard model analog, this phi c, also known as v sometimes, the vacuum expectation value vev of the Higgs field, this is exactly 1 over square root of the square root 2 of gf that Christoph measure, uh, mentioned today. We've measured this vacuum expectation value, and it's this thing that is of order 246 giga electron volt. We measure this, for example, in mu and decay, and in general in the interactions of um, the massive gauge bosons and neutron decay and so on. So this is very well measured. We found this vacuum expectation value. So we know this number. This gives us one constraint on the parameters. Let's work them out so I can write um, dv0 by d phi. This is m squared plus lambda. This is the demand that at phi c, the first derivative is 0. Obviously, it has two solutions. One solution is phi c equals 0, and that's one over here. That's an unstable extremum. But it is not a place that uh, you would like to live for a long time, although we'll discuss it a little bit. Where we actually live is the other solution, this one. So this is the relevant solution. This solution says that m squared is equal to, or minus m squared is equal to lambda phi c squared. This lambda is positive. We'll talk about it in a minute. And so you can see it's consistent. A positive number times phi c squared is equal to um, a positive number, minus of m squared, and m squared is negative, right? So this is all consistent. So that's one relation that we have. Um, another thing we can do, we can ask ourselves, and we can measure at the LHC, what is the mass of Higgs particle excitations around this minimum? And this mass is approximately given by the second derivative of the potential. At phi c. So this is m squared plus 3 lambda uh, phi c squared. And this thing is roughly m, let's call it m phi squared, if I consider little curly phi, the excitation. For us, it's the Higgs particle. And this was also measured at the LHC. I think it's fair to say that this measurement is essentially due to the LEP collider, but I'm willing to stand corrected. So previous accelerators, notably in the late 80s and the 90s, have established this number. This measurement is really due to the Large Hadron Collider from 2012 and so on, 2011, 2012. This was measured, and uh, this is about 125 GeV squared. So, but we already have a relation from the vacuum expectation value. We can plug it in here. If I use the relation for the VEV, then m phi squared is uh, actually 2 lambda phi c squared, or minus 2 m squared. If I put these things together, then the parameters lambda and m squared were really measured because um, we know m phi squared, m phi, is 125 GV. We know phi C or V is 246 GV. These two constraints tell us that lambda, check me, is around 0.13, a dimensionless number, smaller than 1. We're lucky. Theory is perturbative. And um, well, you can do the math for the rest of these things. If I am not wrong, then the m squared is something like minus 
80 something GV squared. So these are the parameters of the, of the theory. Now, this exercise, and it doesn't matter how many derivatives I'll go on taking, cannot measure C because C just drops out in every derivative. C is not dynamical as far as the QFT is concerned. So I cannot measure C, the constant C, with these exercises. But I measured everything else. Astrophysics measured for me the thing on the left. LHC and LAP measured for me most of the stuff on the right. The only thing that's left is C. So we actually know C. We, I can tell you what C is. Let's work it out. So we can combine all of this to ask what is the value of this cute little constant C. OK, that's easy. So rho lambda, which is some 10 to the minus 47 GV to the 4, is equal to V naught at phi C, which is equal to half m squared phi C squared plus lambda over 4 phi C to the 4 plus C. OK. Um, but uh, m squared, we said, is minus lambda phi C squared. So this is minus lambda phi C to the 4 over 2 plus a quarter. So overall, minus a quarter plus C, which is minus 0.13 over 4 times 246 to the 4, GEV to the 4, plus C. So you got your C. Here is the answer. We measured C, at least at the classical level. And the answer is C will do whatever it takes to arrange that C minus some number that you could fill in for yourself times 100 times 100 to the power of 4. So that's 10 to the 8 GV to the 4. This number is all the stuff in here, right? 2 to the 4 times 0.13 over 4. This crazy number, GV to the 4, this is equal to 10 to the minus 47 GV to the 4. For some obscure, at least at the, from the point of view of quantum field theory, reason, nature chose, took C minus some number to be equal to this uh, 10 to the minus 47. So nature, nature has to take a value of C, value of C, precise, let's say, to one part in 10 to the 55 or so to exactly cancel this gap, right? The minus lambda over 8 times 5 to the 4 is exactly the gap between 0 and the place where we are. C exactly cancel that. So the minimum of the potential is not at 0. It's at 0 plus the tiny little 10 to the minus 47 giga electron volt. This is a manifestation of the fine tuning problem associated with the cosmological constant or the vacuum energy density. This realization of the problem is a fine tuning of something like 10 um, to the power of 55. It's completely classical. At this point, we didn't talk about quantum fluctuations or quantum mechanics or anything else. And it's already extremely puzzling, at least for me. It's like, you know, you know this drill for kids when they jump off some little tower and you pull a blanket to stop them before they hit the ground? You pull the blanket, but you pull it bloody 10 to the minus 47 centimeter off the ground, <laughs> okay? That's where you stop them, right? Why the hell didn't you pull the blanket here? Why didn't you pull the blanket here? No, <laughs> just above the ground. The only body that knows that there is a ground, what's a ground? Ground is rho equals zero. 
QFT has nothing to say about this zero. The only person in the room that knows something about where the ground is is GR, gravity. And gravity was not in our game to begin with, right? Somehow the QFT seems to know something about gravity or vice versa. I don't know, but there is this, um, this issue here. Questions or comments? Yeah, there is something there. You can say out loud, I will repeat. <laughs> okay, if you remember, don't hesitate to stop me. Ah, uh, yes, we are. Um, why uh, the same Higgs as the standard model? Sorry? Why are we using the same? Oh, just because I, I, I did this exercise for the toy model, but I'm telling you, if you just replace these um, okay. parameters by the standard model parameters, you actually have the classical Lagrangian density of the real neutral scalar field component of the Higgs, the one that is not eaten by the W and the Z and so on. This really is a toy model of the standard model. Okay. okay? It's not. It's not over-idealizing. It's really this. Okay. So I just did the toy model, but I put the real values of nature, as far as we can tell. Um, uh, if the if, if C was even lower, would this scalar field contribute to with a negative energy? Yes. Towards <laughs> oh. Yes, it would. We would be living in ADS geometry. <laughs> we seem to be living in a universe that is getting closer and closer to the Sitter geometry, that is a positive cosmological constant, very small on particle physics scale, in the sense that you see, small in the sense that you see. And uh, this has very profound implications for cosmology that I'll discuss more later on. Of course, the real proper place to think about these problems is cosmology dynamical evolution of the universe as a whole. This is where the discussion really fits. Quantum field theory, again, doesn't have anything to say. It just did this. Now live with it, right? I have a question. Yes, please. Actually, both. Uh, do you really believe that this is a problem? Because I can use the entropic uh, argument from Weinberg to say, oh, OK. Sure. It's, yeah. It, it, it's, it's there, but uh, if it isn't there, we wouldn't be have life in the in the universe and things like that. So what's your opinion about this fine tuning? Thanks very much. This is an excellent question. Um, my opinion isn't really worth your time to listen to it, to, to be very clear. But yeah. so just to explain the question, because it's very important, the question is worth the time. So the question was as follows. If the value of this cosmological constant was much smaller, then a universe with negative cosmological constant inevitably ends up in a crunch. And therefore, there would have been no space time to live in, <laughs> if you want. So, so in a way, yes, QFT would allow that, but there would be no reality as we know it in this kind of setup. Okay? And uh, if the vacuum energy was much, much larger, a few orders of magnitude larger is enough. And that's really the, the power of Weinberg's argument, just a few orders of magnitude above where we measured it. A universe of that type becomes empty very fast. It exponentially expands. It doesn't have enough time for matter to collapse into galaxies and make stars and make things that look like us, you and me. And so really, our reality probably doesn't exist also here and doesn't exist here. It only exists in, in some interval of a few orders of magnitude of what Rho Lambda could be. And the name of this um, uh, suggestion is anthropic um, reasoning. And it says, right, we, the nature couldn't have done anything else because if it did, we are not living there. It's a fair argument. It's not, and, and even, I can even add, this argument is even can be, con, can taken, can be taken as predictive in a way because Weinberg made it before the cosmological constant was measured by supernova. And uh, if you want an analog to this reasoning that I think you all feel comfortable with, the usual analog is the fact that, uh, you know, we live on a planet, which is a little sphere. We live here. We live on the surface of a tiny little rocky object in the vast void of space. We live on a measure zero <laughs> set, you know. Even with respect to the Earth, there is much more bulk than there is surface, but we don't ask why we live on a measure zero subset of conditions, if you want. And of course, if we go out of the planet, there is even 
There is way more to go in time and space. But you don't ask that because you wouldn't be asking it if you were, you know, lava creatures living in the center of the Earth or AI chips floating, uh, you know, launched by some civilizations, maybe us in the future living out there in the void of the space. You are who you are, and therefore you're forced to live on this measure zero set of conditions. That's an analogy, analogy if you want, and we, it's kind of clear. Um, however, none of these arguments gives an explanation of why quantum field theory does it. When I ask why quantum field theory does it, in a way I'm suggesting, or field theory, this is not even quantum, I'm suggesting that it had a choice <laughs> of some type. So kind of the natural logic there is that, yes, these parameters of the theory could have been whatever you want, it's just only in a subset of them you can live. So maybe there is nothing to ask. That's not impossible. Let's appreciate more aspect of this thing. I, d I don't have a counter, you know, uh, answer to, to this argument. This argument uh, could be there, um, but it's still very interesting to understand what is going on in this theory. Yeah, I understand. Uh, despite it being made for, to, uh, for uh, Weinberg, I think this argument is kind of lazy, but... Sorry? Uh, despite being done by uh, Weinberg, I think this argument is kind of lazy because you don't have to find an a, a answer, you know? No, but you see, what is happening to us is that this beautiful argument is leading us, that's my view, do not quote me. <laughs> it's kind of leading us into a meta-science discussion. It has made its prediction and now, it, now it's more or less done. So as far as we know, and uh, by the way, this could be the answer in principle. It could be that we pushed field theory so far that we kind of reached the bottom that really these numbers are accidental and we couldn't live anywhere else and that's it, don't ask. So, but these discussions, is it lazy, do you like it? I don't know, it is what it is. Okay, uh, just one more question. It, we didn't talk about uh, 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 gravitation, right? But uh, this is a kind of a toy model of the Higgs and the Higgs gives mass to the particles. So can't I kind of connect the mass to the gravity to say that this is somehow connected to, to relativity and gravity, stuff like that? Well, the mass of the particle is, is uh, it's very interesting to consider how mass appears in a theory that includes gravitation, but in principle, the mass of the particle is perfectly well defined in flat space, right? The fact that the particle energy also gravitates with, you know, with some relation to the mass, it gravitates, so really energy and pressure gravitate, right? It's not even the mass. Um, so the short answer, I'm not sure what you're thinking of. Maybe it works. I'm not aware of it. But the mass of the particle, or this Lagrangian, th these particles, even in flat space, these particles have mass. It's the energy cost of putting one particle, just uh, putting it out there, producing it. And it's the pole of the propagator, if you want, to exist regardless of gravity. So I'm not sure that there is, uh, that I know how to connect. Let's go on a little bit more. Can I, can I or there was, I can go on? <laughs> Okay, so this was the classical picture. Let me conclude it with one part in 10 to the 55. Precision on what this number is. Now let's consider the quantum mechanical picture. Um, and here the story becomes uh, maybe even more interesting to some extent. So let's consider the quantum mechanical um, situation here. So to do this, what do we really mean by quantum mechanics? We mean that the field configuration is localized near this phi c, but as you know, a quantum field also always has zero-point fluctuations. So if I write my field as the vacuum expectation value of it plus a small fluctuation phi, small fluctuation field phi, and then this definition is such that the quantum expectation value is phi c, quantum expectation value of phi, is zero, then that's good and well, but when I quantize the fluctuations, then I'm led to an extra contribution to the energy density that is quantum. And in quantum field theory, let's consider non-interacting fields for a second, then this vacuum energy will be the following. Let's call this V1, a suggestive name, coming from these quantum fluctuations. This has a factor of H bar in front of it. Then in quantum field theory, what you do, you sum over all k modes for particle fluctuations. Particle fluctuations are just plane waves in this theory. And uh, here you have the energy of a particle fluctuation divided by two. 
This is the analog of a single harmonic oscillator, which would have a zero-point energy when it's living in its ground state. It would have a zero-point energy equal to omega over two, the fundamental frequency um, omega over two. But here, there are an infinite set of these um, harmonic oscillators. Each one has an omega k, which is the square root of k squared plus m phi squared. So you're used to it, you've seen it, usually you time order it and forget about it, right? That's what you do when you do qu uh, quantum field theory, but that would be your first naive guess on what's going on. So having, having written this h bar here, I'm gonna leave it, I'm gonna set it to one in everything else that I'm doing. But remember it's there, if you want. So in fact, now consider what is the value of this m phi squared in this theory. So what I did, I wrote phi this way, I expanded it. Well, let us expand the potential. V of phi, V0 of phi, is V0 of phi C plus var phi. Let me write it here. So that is half M squared phi C squared, phi C to the four, plus, I mean, you can do this expansion, but uh, I cannot. Let me read it from somewhere. So the phi terms are as follows. There is this one. Phi to the four. All I did was to expand the potential. And here, this m phi squared is m squared plus 3 lambda phi c squared. This is exactly the expression I used before to calculate the mass of the Higgs particle. These are Higgs particles in the standard model analog of our theory. And that's the model that we have now. Because we're expanding, if we consider this expansion to be happening near, near the vacuum expectation value um, of the Higgs, then this term is zero. And there is no tadpole for phi. But let's be a little bit more ambitious and consider how would this interaction, how would this potential now, effective potential for phi fluctuations look like if we agreed to consider it in different places in field space. What does it mean? What does it mean to think of the la effective Lagrangian for phi fluctuations in some other place in field space, away from V? Let's now reserve this name to V, really. Okay, what, would, what does it mean if I quantize the field around another point. The answer is non-trivial. The meaning of uh, quantizing the field around another point is non-trivial for the reason you can expect if I put my field here, it's going to roll. It's going to roll down classically. As it rolls down classically, it's rolling. is going to be, it's a time-dependent behavior of the field. It's going to be mixed to some extent with the dynamics of fluctuations around it because the background is rolling. I'm going to neglect that. Okay, imagine that if there is rolling, it's slow enough that it's interesting to ask what is the, if you want, instantaneous adiabatic structure, structure of the potential for five fluctuations near a given point. By the way, this discussion will become particularly interesting if, when we think of the potential this way, if there are points like this one, for example, or maybe somewhere else far in field space, could there be places where there is another far away minimum of the potential, not this one, where, in fact, if I put the field, it stays. In places like that, the theory of phi, now understood as a general function of phi c, is particularly simple to understand. Okay, the field is really there, it has fluctuations, we, quant we quantize them, and uh, we ask ourselves what to do. And so you see, the effective mass of fluctuations of the field in various places in field space, lambda and m, are just our old good constants that we've measured. We've measured because we've measured the actual properties of fluctuations where we live. So we know these parameters. 
But now these parameters allow us to ask what is the spectrum of particles if we place our field somewhere far in field space. That's the mental exercise I would like us to do. And of course, in addition to this, we can also calculate at the good old vacuum. Great. So what would happen if you go far, far in space? Then this object, you see, is not very silly. In fact, inside of this omega of k, there is a dependence on where we're looking in phi c space, here, through here, through this relation. This object that I just wrote, that you've seen many times in your life, is, in fact, up to a constant, the object that is known as the Coleman-Weinberg potential. There, is, there are two additional derivations in my notes that I will share with you, with more loops and stuff and fancy stuff, but this is actually the one and the same object. To make it more familiar, let's play with this a little bit. So V1 is a half D3K over 2 pi cubed square root K squared plus omega K squared, right? Yes. Um, yes. No. <laughs> M. Thanks. So the first thing you see when you look at this object is if you consider very, very high k contributions, this object at very large k, much, much larger than m phi, this object scales like uh, an integral um, d3k times k which if we cut off, this object is formally divergent, like uh, you know, the, the boundary to, to the four. So if we cut it off at some cut of lambda, then this goes like some numbers times lambda to the four. So this is formally divergent. That's not necessarily a huge problem. So Christophe has asked about this in the past. This formal divergency means that we have to be careful when we interpret quantum field theory parameters or Lagrangians when we try to calculate quantum, calcu quantum computations, okay? But formally, this is divergent. More carefully, this result comes from, you know, quantum fluctuations of the Higgs field at energy scales where we study them at the LHC, up to energies of about 1 TeV, maybe 10 TeV. Up to one of, you know, few TeV, we really know what goes on into the theory. We see these fluctuations, we see their effects, and so, what we really can get from that, that we'd expect before even analyzing this structure, this V1 should contain something that looks like, you know, at least 10 TV, let's say, to the power of 4, plus other things. That's not even counting the divergency that I have to interpret. There will be finite contributions that are of this order, just from known physics at this scale. So at the quantum level, kind of the first answer that you will get the first answer that quantum mechanics will ask for rho lambda is gibberish. Let's call this gibberish infinity, but this is not. We have to be careful about interpreting quantum field theory. But the more intelligible answer is that the fine tuning now looks like something, you know, one, two, let's call it lambda over 100. Um, no, over 10 to the minus 3 EV to the 4 with lambda now 10 TV instead of 100 GV. So the fine tuning is at least you know, a few orders of magnitude above this 10 to the 55. And maybe it's as high as taking lambda to the Planck scale. That's what people somebody sometimes do. They say, our QFT, suppose I trust it up to the Planck scale, then this lambda is 10 to the 19 giga electron volt. And then the number here becomes 120, 10 to the factor to the power 120. That's the, if you want a harsh statement about the hierarchy problem. But we don't know if QFT really applies that high and what happens there. So that's the first perspective. It's just a constant. Okay, that's qualitatively kind of similar to what we saw at the classical level. There is a constant, it is very big. We can't compute it, it is what it is, it is very big. Just to note, whatever this constant is, is as big as it is, it doesn't take away the fact that even the classical picture is fine-tuned at, at one part in 10 to the 55. 
right? So whatever the mechanism, if there is a mechanism that is taking care of this situation, it's maybe aggravated, you know, aggravated by quantum corrections, but the basic point is still the same. It has to take care of quantum corrections and classical effects at the same time. So that's the constant. Now I cried about the constant, I'll ignore the constant. And I'll study the landscape of this object. How does it depend on phi, really? How does this potential look like as a function of phi? Um, so, so to say this, to bring this to familiar form, it's actually nice to take a derivative first if we don't care. Oh, we're done with the constant. Let me take a derivative with respect to m phi squared. The only field dependence of this object is inside of m phi squared. So up to field independent stuff, I can just take the derivative of this. If I take a derivative, this is a quarter. And now you can really quickly bring it to, to a familiar form because this object is just a half integral d3k 2 pi cubed. And let me add another integral, dq over 2 pi, 1 over q squared plus k squared plus m phi squared. OK, if you're not familiar with this kind of integrals, I'll just do one. The rest I more or less will quote. You do have a bit of integrals today. So if this identity is not obvious to you, just consider this integral in the complex plane. So let's consider this Q integral in the complex Q plane. Our original Q integral runs on the real axis. And it has poles above and below the real axis because I can write 1 over Q squared plus omega k squared, right? This is omega k squared as 1 over q plus i times q minus omega k. And so there is a pole above and a pole below on the imaginary axis. And now my integral decays like, k like q squared, so it vanishes fast enough into infinity, so nothing stops me to close the contour either above or below, it doesn't matter, and pick up any residue you want. Picking up this residue will give you the extra factor of 2, and um, the 2 pi cancels from this exercise. So you have an i from the pole itself, and you have 2 pi i from the residue theorem, and there is no i. So that's just an identity, but if you put it in Mathematica, it will tell you the answer as well. That's very good. This I can write as 1 over 2, d4k over 2 pi to the 4. Let me call this k Euclidean, 1 over k Euclidean squared plus m phi squared, where k Euclidean squared is ke0 squared plus ke vector squared. And you just understand q as the, if you want, the 0 component of this Euclidean four momentum. And now this should be familiar to many of you who are doing quantum field theory. And obviously, this is very easy to integrate. Again, we don't care about the constant, so you just integrate this with respect to m phi squared. And you find that this v1, just integrating this thing, is equal to a half d4ke. log plus m phi squared of phi c, which should be familiar as the Coleman one potential after weak rotation. Good. So this vacuum energy knows everything, yes? E? The k0? It is the one aware. Oh, I just said that uh, this object, k, 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 bar k vector is the three momentum. Yes, yes. And q is just an auxiliary integration variable that I added. And I just noted um, 
this can be thought of as the Euclidean square or, or the square of a Euclidean four vector now. Uh -huh. Suppose now I, I prepare for you a four vector that has Q, K1, K2, K3. And I say what is here is that just the Euclidean square of it. It's Q squared plus K vector squared. Okay, but when integrated uh, in the complex plane, uh, there is no issue about uh, uh, about the integration, the, the pole that you introduce, and then you use it to make the computation. There is no issue that. Uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean, but I literally th this was just this integral uh -huh. to show that this integral is, equi is equal to that that integral, integral on the left. So all ah, I did okay. is to, so I just literally wrote this integral here. The integrand vanishes sufficiently fast that, li that Q goes to infinity. Uh -huh. So I can do anything I want with the, with the boundary that touches at infinity. In particular, I can close the contour, and the arc gives me nothing. And so by the residue theorem, I can pick this pole. Mm -hmm. If you do this exercise, it gives you 2 pi i and uh, times the residue, and the residue is this i omega, 2 i omega k. OK, great. That's all I did. There Thank is no. But now, having done this just to show the equivalence, I'm using this expression because it's familiar to QFT people, maybe. OK, so this little modest thing that you always normal order and forget about is, in fact, the kolman weinberg potential. But of course, I took a derivative and integrated. I lost all memory of the constant that was there. You can put any other constant you want. We're just going to measure it. We didn't predict it anyway. So if you don't care about the constant, that's what you've got. Now, this object is infinite, very badly, formally infinite. But it's actually the fact that it's infinite doesn't mean it's dumb. It is, in fact, very, very smart. Before I use it to do things, let's just convince you that it is smart. What does this object know? And also maybe justify a little bit the fact that uh, there is particle physics in the title of what we're doing. Let's calculate a little bit of diagrams. So this V1 is really smart. In fact, it contains all the information you know about the low energy theory, quantum low energy theory of these five VAR5 fluctuations. So in fact, you can show that if you consider the one particle irreducible vertex functions of five fields, vertex functions, of five fields, let me call these M, N. So this is a vertex function where one, two, ta, 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 N var five fields go to a point and interact. This V1 actually generates for you all of these. And because we're working at leading order in H bar, this is a one loop answer for this. So it's fun to do the exercise. Um, I would want to do it. So for this, basically what I'm telling you is you saw we wrote the potential now shifted, and we have a shifted theory, or the theory in terms of the quantum theory in terms of quantum fluctuations of our phi's. And now the claim is this V1 is so smart that in fact V1, it's a function of phi c, yes? By itself, it has no var phi in it. It was just an integral with respect to the mass parameter of the var phi. This is, in fact, equal to a sum and goes to 0 to infinity, phi c to the n over n factorial. And those vertex functions at the point where all momenta of the external fields are set to 0. In other words, if you want to calculate for yourself some scattering matrix element or, you know, one of these vertex functions, all you have to do is go to this very simple potential that we calculated with very little work and take, the take derivatives of it. So minus m n at p equals 0 is just d n v1 by d phi c to the n. So there is an infinite constant. It doesn't matter. The object contains all the information you want in terms of uh, one PIs. Who knew this and worked about this and knows exactly what I'm talking about? Don't hesitate to lift your hand. Because uh, you are the people who are going to suffer most 
I think. Okay. So not a lot of you are going to suffer most. <laughs> because what I want to do, I want to demonstrate this. Right? We're physicists. Let's just demonstrate this point. This point is important. Let's calculate. Ooh, this I don't want to kill. V0 of phi with phi equal phi c plus var phi is what I wrote here. Let's use this theory to calculate the simplest thing. Let's calculate the two-point function, the two-point vertex functions of phi. And we will do it at one loop. So, a one loop calculation, because we're doing particle physics to test this idea with the potential that we so carelessly calculated. Here is my claim. My claim is if you consider the 1pi amputated two point correlation function at zero momentum for two var phi fields, this is m2. This should better be equal to minus d2 v1 by d phi c squared. <laughs> Taking the second derivative is really easy. Doing loop calculations is harder, but let's do them. So at one loop, what contributes to this? This field blob, field blob is equal to the following thing. So first, there is just the, the mass of this object. So here it's m phi squared. So this object here is minus i m phi squared, right? I need minus i times the, I need the like, i times the Lagrangian, interaction Lagrangian. I'm treating here the m phi squared as an interaction. And so I have minus i m phi squared because in the Lagrangian you have the minus of this stuff. And then there are loops. There is this loop, and there is this loop. These are the one-loop contributions to this um, two-point function. You can check me. Um, how did I call them? I think I gave them name. This I call, let's call it 1a. And this, let's call it 1b. And this, let's call it 0. Um, so m2, or more precisely, i m2 is minus i m phi squared plus i m 1a plus i m 1b. It's really quickly compute. I'm going to do most of the work, but I will leave you a little bit of integrals to do for yourself. And I really recommend that you do it once in your life at least. So I am 1A is really just this object, and it comes from this interaction vertex. And so this is minus I lambda over 4 coming from just this Lagrangian element. Now, what do we have? What is the symmetry factor of this? We have two var phi's outside, and we had one vertex to contract with. So there are four possibilities to do this, three possibilities to do this. And so what you have in front here is four factorial over two. Just the combinatorics of how many contractions I have. And then there is a propagator, and that's it. And we're working with Feynman boundary conditions. This entire calculation is an in-out calculation. For those of you who care about it, we're calculating an S-matrix element. And so we're working with Feynman boundary conditions. That's the thing I need to do. So that's the first one. And what's the second one? M1b. It's this one. It's second order in the Taylor expansion. Notice amusingly that there are different powers of lambda in the one loop contribution. It's not an expansion in lambda, it's an expansion in loops. And that's the first um, term in the expansion in loops. So what we have here is uh, this vertex, really. So we have minus i lambda phi c squared 
just from this person. There is a 1 over 2 because there are two vertices happening, and we need to construct the following thing, the external legs with our two vertices. So there are three possibilities here times two because I could choose which vertex to talk to. Here there are three possibilities, and here there are two possibilities, so three factorial squared. And then there are two propagators for this object. But notice, importantly, that to make my life easy, I was only working at zero external momentum. So the momentum flowing here and here is zero. And so there is only one momentum in the integral, actually. So there are just two propagators. So what I have, d4k, 2 pi to the 4. I have i squared. plus i epsilon squared. Why did I write it here? My god. And you didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, you got to stop me, because I will be very upset if you don't. OK, we don't actually have to calculate any of these things to show the identity I'm interested in. The only thing I'm interested in at this point is to give you an example that this statement is true. So I'm not going to calculate these integrals. In fact, I cannot because they're all divergent. And what I'm showing you here is valid even before you regularize, up to a little mathematical cheat, which has to do with weak rotation. So. Work it out, this integral um, I can write as follows. Um, so there is an i and a minus i, so no i is left. You work at all the factors. I have 3 lambda, 2 pi to the 4, 1 over k squared minus m phi squared plus i epsilon. Now comes the little cheat. I will do it, but I will tell you I'm doing it, so I'm not really a professional cheater. <laughs> The cheat I will do is that I will do the usual weak rotation. The weak rotation is an analytic continuation. But so to make it legit, you need some properties of the integral to hold, and this integral doesn't have them. Um, so the weak rotation says, OK, so now in the complex, if you want um, k0 plane, slice of this integral, I have the following integral. And this integral has poles below and above, check it, um, the real axis because of this Feynman i epsilon, infinitesimally close, below and above. These poles just tell you boundary condition. Now, here is my little cheat. The integrand, when you work out the fact that this d4k, you can write it as dk times k cubed, right? If you go to radial coordinate, because this thing is spherically symmetric in four dimensions. Um, then the integrand of this object is, in fact, not convergent for the entire k integral. And so it is sensitive to what happens very far away in k space. Nevertheless, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just twist the point at infinity up here and the point at infinity up here, and I'm going to do the integral this way. I can do this twist. If the integrand would converge at infinity, I could do this twist because it doesn't cross any pole. And I have an analytic function. So I'm allowed to do this. I'm allowed to do this as long as the integrand isn't sensitive to what is happening at the endpoints. This integrand does. So you need to understand that to make this really, really meaningful, you have to regularize the integrand. Imagine you have regularized it in any way you want. You subtracted the sensitivity at infinity. It doesn't matter to us. It's absorbed in the constants. So I'll recrutate. I'll recrutate already at the level of this expression. Weak rotation means that I'm going to take dk0 to be equal to i, let's call it dke, and the vector part is not changed. Um, dke vector. When I do this, I just put an e here. I have a minus because k squared, of course, Minkowski metric is k0 squared 
minus k squared, k Euclidean, sorry, squared, or this is equal if you want, to minus k0 Euclidean squared minus k squared, which is minus k Euclidean squared, which is k Euclidean 0 squared plus k Euclidean vector squared. That's all I did. So I get a minus here. Let me put the minus out and put the i here and put the plus. If you've written this integral before, all you have to do is follow my rotation and you get the answer. OK, so that's one contribution that I have. Notice there is an i here, but there is also an i on the definition of the matrix, S matrix element that lives here. It's almost an S matrix element because I'm ignoring wave function renormalization, but that's OK for us. Let me write the answer about this guy. You can do exactly the same trick and collect the factors. And this one gives me uh, i over 2, 6 lambda squared, phi c squared, d4 k e, 2 pi to the 4. I squared, and there is now this. You see, once I weak rotated, I've used the epsilon in the pole prescription. I don't need the epsilon anymore. We've used it, and the analytic continuation was already at the level of introducing it, so here we just rotated. Okay, so I did my two diagrams. All that is left for me to do, and uh, you know what? Let's get the eye out of here. So multiply by minus i, by minus i. I'm not doing anything. I'm just taking, getting rid of some i's. Here there is a 1, and here there is a 1. There was a question? OK. So I worked really hard. I calculated this. Agree with me, this was a horrible thing to do. But we did it. Now let's just casually take derivatives of our oracle function. That's much easier. I'm going to erase this stuff. I hope it's OK. Oop. So let me take derivatives. In fact, I hope I didn't say something wrong before. This v1 generates just the loops. The tree-level contribution to the potential before the loops is generated by the tree-level part of the potential, v0. Okay, So this im squared is just coming from this object here when you take two, di two derivatives. So if I write v effective equals v0 plus v1, then my uh, big theorem applies. The derivatives of the v effective are the entire set of 1pi's. If I only have v1, it's just the loop contribution to the 1pi. Fine. So let's take the derivative of this thing. D2, V, I'll, let's do the, just the, the, the loop part. D phi C squared is D by D. OK. Just the derivative of the log. What I get when I do this, but check me, is following. k squared plus m phi squared squared. So first derivative by phi c of the log. Maybe I should write it if it's not obvious. Oh, you know what? i let you do these derivatives. It's very easy. First derivative, you see derivatives with respect to phi c only act on m. So you take a derivative with respect to m, and just the log becomes 1 over k squared. Already has the familiar form of the stuff that you see um, in those diagrams, and the derivative 
of m phi squared with respect to phi c is just a derivative with respect to phi c of m squared plus 3 lambda phi c squared, which is just 6 lambda phi c. That's the origin of all these factors of 6 that are floating around everywhere when you do this uh, calculation. And so it better be, I let you check that what I got is the correct object. Let's check this one. Remember, there is a minus sign between them. So let's check one of them. Let's check this one. It's exactly the 6 lambda squared, phi c squared. It's the same thing that exists here, and the propagator squared. Okay, And I let you be careful a little bit and do the derivatives. Okay, So all this painful exercise was to show taking derivatives is really easy. Moreover, this calculated for us all endpoint functions of the phi's at zero momentum. This was just the two-point function. If you were to do the four-point function or six-point functions, there could be additional contributions and more diagrams to compute. And so it's a really smart object. It knows all of this endpoint function, and we just showed it with one example. How much time do I have, actually? 20 minutes is great. OK. So we have our object. It has information about the structure of the potential, and it calculates endpoint functions. So it's really smart. What are we going to do with it? What we're going to do with it is we need to compute it and ask ourselves, how then does the energy density of the universe look like when you include the Varfi fluctuations? How does it look like, looks like in different places in field, in field space? So we have no choice. We have to subtract the infinite constants from our calculation. So we have to regularize to do this exercise. What do we expect will happen? What we can expect will happen is that when we add this potential, so now our effective potential, right? Our effective potential is V0 of phi C plus V1 of phi C that is written over there. After we regularize and match the observations, what we can expect is that the shape near the vacuum where we're at is going to change a little bit. But the real interesting question is, what happens far away in field space? So we have to regularize this object. I'll skip most of the steps of this. Um, but you can see it in my notes. It's actually easier to regularize. Usually, people regularize dv1 by m, d m phi squared, which is still divergent. It is what we had before. phi squared, Euclidean. What I will use is dimensional regularizations. Oops. Worian, what you do, you have a divergent integral. You want to bookkeep for, you want to do some bookkeeping device to capture the infinities that you will subtract and contain all the finite information of this integral. So the way dimensional regularization works in a lightning nutshell description is you look at this integral and you ask yourself, hey, why is it giving me trouble? It's giving me trouble because the dimension of space-time is 4, so the numerator blows up like k to the 4 at very large k, but the denominator is only k squared, so the entire thing blows up very fast. What if I lived in a more lucky universe that had lower number of dimensions, d? Suppose the number of dimensions d, d was actually 4 minus epsilon. And now let's press epsilon down. And in fact, if epsilon was, if I made epsilon big enough, so if epsilon was larger than 2, then this integral eventually would begin to converge. And I can walk. The beautiful magic of DMREG is what you do is you promote this kind of integral to an integral in d dimensions. Well, will I write it? I write it here. D, D, K, E over 2 pi to the D. 
When I teach this in class, it's a few lectures, so this is going to be faster. You're going to calculate this object. If d, if, uh, d is smaller enough than 4, then this object is calculable. You'll calculate that this is an analytic function of the number of dimensions. And then you'll try to take, in the end, the number of dimensions to 4. And you see what happens. What will happen is, and that's the beauty of this, what will happen is this object, when you take d to 4 after you compute, it will diverge. But beautifully, it will diverge like a meromorphic or analytic functions in the number of, of dimensions. There will be just simple poles proportional to powers of um, 1 over epsilon, basically. One thing I like to do, and it's, it will be useful for us, is to make sure that the object that you compute always has the correct physical dimension, which is 4. So I will compensate the fact that I changed the integration measures into d to the d. I'll compensate it by some power mu to power 4 minus d. Mu is a placeholder, parameter of dimension mass, that I just introduce into this um, uh, deformation of the integral. OK? Nothing physical can depend on mu. I just did it for proper bookkeeping, so the object itself always has the correct dimension. I didn't have to do it, but it's good to do it. OK, here's the place where I skip to the answer. And I'm sorry about this, but otherwise it will take really too much time. When you do this exercise, in fact, let me skip even more. When you do this exercise, you will find some function. Let's call it function of phi c times some constants times a factor of 1 over epsilon when you make d close to 4 and keep the epsilon in place. So you're going to find an object that remembers the fact that the original integral was divergent. This was dv by dm phi squared. At any epsilon different from 0, this object is regular. Right? It blows up when you take epsilon to 0, but mathematically you can work with it. It's a finite function. And so nothing stops me from integrating. So to get back to my regularized v1, I just integrate with respect to m phi squared, and let me write the answer that I get. The answer is that v1 and uh, in DIMREG, in dimensional regularization, this v1 of phi c is the following. You have this integral in my notes, and you have it in many books. So you get one part of the result. That's a part, if you want, the finite part that doesn't have the epsilon in it. And the second part I'll write in red is uh, to the 4. Looks like this. Two over epsilon. This is the part that did care about epsilon. This is also a function of phi c. Gamma e is just a constant. This gamma e is Euler's constant. It's something like 0.57. It's just a number. It's part of the junk that was associated with this dimensional regularization. And it's not important for any physical calculation that we're going to do. The reason I wrote these terms in red is because when you walk in the renormalized perturbation theory, which is what we have just done, we regularize using DIMREG and we match the observations, the stereo observations. Then you have counter terms. And notice that what comes in front of the infinite terms is proportional to m phi to the 4. So this term, this object, infinite, is proportional to something that looks just like the structure of the original potential. It looks like m squared plus. Can you see this color? I hope. m squared plus 3 lambda phi c squared. Squared. m to the 4 is m squared squared times this stuff, right? That is stuff plus 1 over epsilon times some pi's. 
this polynomial of the fields has the same structure as my original three-level Lagrangian. It has a phi squared term, it has a phi to the four term, and it has a constant term. The functional dependence is exactly the same. So if I would take this integral as I do, this potentially as I do in renormalized perturbation theory, what I would do is I would add a counter term to the phi squared, the phi to the four, and the constant pieces. And wave function normalization, not important here. And so these extra terms can be designed to swallow that, because what I have here is a constant, m squared squared, a phi to the four, phi squared squared, and uh, a phi squared term. So it's exactly the correct structure, structure to be absorbed by counter terms. And there is a famous scheme called modified subtraction, ms bar, where what you do is you choose your counter terms to just eliminate this part. And now this is a regularized, renormalized, it's almost renormalized, it's implicitly renormalized, it's almost matched observation, I didn't do it yet, effective potential. And here is what's interesting about that. What I chose to keep has a functional dependence that was not originally in the, um, in the V0, in the original Lagrangian I wrote. You see, you have this log. This log was not there. I cannot, in particular, I cannot absorb it in any counter term of the theory. This 3 halves is a pure convention. This 3 half I could easily have absorbed inside of some of these finite terms. It's also, it's also a polynomial. The fact I didn't absorb it is just for convenience of some computations. In other schemes of the calculation, you keep a different constant. The key point is that there is a new function and all different regularization and normalization schemes that are consistent are going to give you the same coefficient for this new function. That is the key point. This is the real effect of um, the loop calculation. And now what happens, what does this new function do? This is really the new physical, physically important result. This is essentially the new functions that I have to add to the effective potential. What does it do to the structure? Well, in my toy model, my toy model only has the var phi, and the effective potential literally, the new contribution to it is literally just this object that is written here. And you can see what this object does at small fields. So maybe I should say this mu is an arbitrary parameter. I can choose it to be whatever I want. Nothing in the physics can depend on it. I'll explain next time why things don't depend on it. But let's set it to 100 GeV. I can set it to some number and then define the theory. So this is just a constant. What does this theory say? At small fields, when m phi squared is of order mu, of, when m phi is of order mu, this quantum correction is very small. If you ask about the dependence in field space, look how this looks like. This looks like, um, so m phi squared, this, this is m squared plus 3 lambda phi squared over 64 pi squared log. Whatever, small constant. Uh, this is to the four, of course. Thanks. On dimensional grounds, and obviously the answer is th this comes to the four. So I have this thing to the four. So what does the quantum correction do? If the log is not very large, that is, if this object m phi squared, that the point in field space we're computing it is of order my reference scale, which is again, let's make it of order near the, um, the ground state that we live in then this would be order one. And then this contribution is not different qualitatively up to, again, a log correction. It's not different qualitatively with what I already have in my classical part of the Lagrangian. However, it is small because there is a 64 pi squared. There is a loop factor in front. The coupling we measured, it's roughly 0 0.13. And so you see the m squared contribution or the m squared phi squared contribution from here to the quadratic part of the Lagrangian is really suppressed. It has some pi squares and so on. It's small. And so this qualifies the statement I made that as long as this log is not very big, I will have small corrections. They are quantitatively, quantitatively there, and they can, in principle, aspects of them can be measured, but they are qualitative, qualitatively small. They don't make a big impact here. But what happens when I go to field space such that this phi c 
is much, much larger than mu, which was arbitrary, so I set it of order v in the first exercise. So what happens when this phi c is very, very big? In particular, what happens when phi c squared is much, much larger than m squared? So here there is an equality. This would go when phi c is much, much larger than m, right, loosely speaking, or v, this would go to something like um, 9 lambda squared phi c to the 4. I can neglect this thing over 64 pi squared. Log of uh, the 3 lambda, I don't care. So phi c squared over mu squared. And so when phi c is large enough, this log is going to kick in, and it's going to modify the behavior of the function. And you can see what happens in this pure lambda phi to the 4, the pure scalar theory. This correction is positive at very large field space. And so in this pure scalar theory, in fact, the, the way the correction will look like, it will, oops, it will do something like this. It will give extra stabilization to the potential at very large fields. That's what happens in our pure toy model. But now, if I jump to the actual standard model, in the standard model, you have to enhance this calculation by adding the zero-point fluctuations of all those other fields that exist in the standard model. And in fact, if you do it and repeat exactly the same calculation, you will retrieve the Coleman-Weinberg effective potential, including those degrees of freedom. The answer that you will find extends the result we found in a very simple way, basically just by counting degrees of freedom. So now, V1 in the standard model in dimensional regularization in the MS bar subtraction scheme, you have to sum on all the degrees of freedom of the theory. I would be the Higgs field, which is the equivalent of our phi. It will be things like W plus minus, the Z, it will be the top, and everybody else in the theory that couples directly to the Higgs. Here there will be MI to the 4. Here there would be MI squared. The constant here is a little different for different fields. That is not very important, and that is, again, scheme-dependent. So, for example, in MS bar, fermions like the top um, uh, field and bosons, scalar um, bosons like the Higgs, have this factor three halves. Vector bosons like the Z and the W, they have, I think, five, six. It's a different number. It's not very crucial for us. This part is not very important. What is important is that in front here, there will be a number of degrees of freedom, ni. For our calculation, there was one real degree of freedom. It was phi. So n phi is equal to 1 for one real scalar field. But in the standard model, there are other things. So for example, n z, the z, in the spontaneously broken phase of the theory, it has um, three degrees of freedom. And so it has three states with two polarization each, in fact, right? Am I screwing it up? Let me make sure that I didn't read it wrong. Let's just count degrees of freedom. So I have, in fact, um, I just have three polarization states. That's all I have. So the, the number of degrees of freedom for the Z is three. Fermions have this funny feature that this effective factor is negative. It goes back to the anti-commutation relation. Other than that, it's exactly the same. You add the zero-point fluctuations. You just put a minus in front. And for the top, the, the number of degrees of freedom are, it's a Dirac fermion, so it has four spin degrees of freedom, or top, anti-top, and the two spin states. And it has color degrees of freedom under QCD, because it, has, um, it is a fundamental representation of QCD, and there is a minus, as I said, 
So effectively, it is minus 12. Another thing that you want to know is that the Higgs particle in the standard model is the one that has the most complicated expression for its mass, m phi squared, which is the one that I wrote before. All the other states in the standard model are chiral in the sense that their masses are just linearly proportional to the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs. So for example, the mass of the top that you have to put into this expression is equal to the Yukawa of the top times phi c over square root of 2. It's just proportional to phi c. Similarly, the mass of the w is proportional to the weak gauge coupling g times uh, phi c and so on. All the masses of these particles are just simply proportional to phi c. And so you have to do this sum. And you can see the most important contributions at very large fields always come from this phi to the 4 term that lives inside of this m4. So at, at very large field, you can ignore the little m squared of, uh, of the Higgs fluctuation. For all the others, it's just a very simple phi to the 4. That's what you get. And the most interesting contribution actually has to do with the top quark. So the top quark includes something that looks like minus a 12 from this object times y top to the 4, phi c to the 4. And I have square root of 2, so I have a 4, 64 pi squared, log yt to u squared, and additional contributions. And it just so happens that this yt was measured in the LHC, and actually at Fermilab even before, in a way, and it is of order 1. This is a very large coupling. It's the largest coupling that directly participates in this exercise. And it's negative. It comes in in a negative sign. As a result of this, in the actual standard model version of the toy exercise we did, the quantum correction is not just silly steepening of the potential. But when you go to very large fields, when you cannot neglect this log, it actually, because of the top, it softens the potential. And it softens the potential in a very interesting way. This was toy, this was classical, this is standard model. At large enough field space, the top softens this potential, and in fact, it drives it negative. <laughs> or at least it drives it down. At extremely large field values, the actual standard model effective potential, inspected as a function of the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs, has a maximum and then goes down. When you really study this, you have to be a little bit careful because you have to improve. You have to take care of the fact that, you know, here, very loosely speaking, I was considering large fields as phi being much larger than mu. Mu is not physical. You want to take care of it. You do it. There is a technique called renormalization um, group improvement. So you can basically replace this mu in a, swart, in a smart way, so you are not sensitive to this exercise. It's a technicality. It's in my notes. I leave it there. But this is under control. What I'm trying to say is that this effect is perturbative, calculable, and under control. This structure by now has been calculated, the important part, to three-loop accuracy. And it's there, and it's robust. The one-loop picture stays correct qualitatively. Quantitatively, it changes a little bit. All the features of this potential as a function in field space depend completely on the value of coupling constants, like this depends, depends, the result, this structure in field space depends on couplings, like lambda, like the gauge couplings, also the strong gauge couplings, a two loop and a high and above, and uh, the Yukawa coupling of the top, and so on, a set of couplings. All of them we've measured at the LHC and other accelerators. So using these measurements at particle physics accelerators, done for particle excitations right here, you can actually compute the structure far away. Within the uncertainties of these couplings, experimental uncertainties, the structure is somewhere in between the potential reaching down and then eventually going up, or the potential 
You see, this is, an, this is, if you want, an experimental uncertainty. So we can do this calculation. This is zero, I remind you. This right here is rho lambda to remind us why we're here. Within experimental uncertainty, the potential does something like this. This is the phi C axis. So this uncertainty band, this is zero right here, is essentially not theoretical anymore. The, theoretic, the theory is very perturbative. The theoretical calculations are under control. If I go even farther away, I get in trouble because I get very close to the Planck scale. But this structure is far below the Planck scale. It's under control. These details are harder to compute, but they're not at the Planck. There are a couple of orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. And so the theory predicts that the structure has another minimum very far away from where we live. And here is the beautiful thing, and that's the slide on top I started with. It's a mind-boggling slide <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. This calculation was done by several groups, and I'm showing results from one of these groups. But again, it's perturbative, and everybody agree on the answer. How much time? Am I, am I over? Zero. I have zero time. I will just say in, uh, in, in really just a few words on this zero time. What is this plot? I'll explain the details uh, tomorrow about this plot. The, so the, the x and y axis on the different squares are numerical values of standard model parameters. For example, over here is alpha strong. It's the strong gauge coupling. Measure the DLHC. Here is the top mass, top quark mass, proportional to yt, yes? And uh, down here is the mass of the Higgs, proportional to lambda. So these are experimental measurements. Depending on what the numerical values of the parameter is, this moves you around inside of this uncertainty band of the structure. For example, if you take the top mass to zero, if the top UK was very small, whoops, if the top UK was very small, then if the top was really very, very light, this destabilization wouldn't happen, okay? Now, the plots are, are separated. You see there is red that is called instability, there is green that is called absolute stability, and there is uh, yellow that is metastability. These names mean the following thing. If the potential never crosses zero, suppose the potential never crossed zero, this kind of configuration would be called stable. That is, there is another minimum, but the one we live in is energetically preferred compared to the other minimum. That's the green range. If, however, the parameters of the, of the theory are such that the curve goes below, then you are either metastable or you are stable, one of these, or you are unstable, thank you. Unstable means if the top was very heavy, you would be driven very strongly to an instability. And so what would happen if you place our universe here, well, somebody did, we live here, a universe placed here or a state placed here would tunnel through this barrier into this energetically preferred vacuum, and it would tunnel much faster than the age of the universe we live in today. So it is physically inconsistent for us to live in a situation where there is another vacuum too deep down. I'll explain more next time. That's unstable. And um, metastable means the remote vacuum is a little below us, but the barrier is big enough that you will tunnel eventually, but it will take much more time than the age of the universe. Amazingly, the measurements at the LHC and the other experiments put us here. You see this little ellipse? This is the actual measured values of the parameters of the standard model. So for some amazing reason, you see, and this happens in a multi-dimensional multi parameter space. These are the most important parameters. But amazingly, this, the strength of the gauge interactions and the top Yukawa are just such that we are just at grazing impact, if you want, of this thing. Okay? 
Again, to remind you, QFT shouldn't care at all about this stuff, right? It doesn't care about absolute minimum, but the far away vacuum seems to just bounce um, off zero. And it happens again in different uh, parameters, and these are just zoom in versions of, of the story. So I meant to discuss this more, I'll discuss it more tomorrow, but um, the observations is an experimental observation, basically, right? We measure the parameters of the theory here. We can compute the structure of the free energy of the potential of the Higgs. And the structure is there is a, vacu uh, a, a stable a, a vacuum, a local vacuum here. And there is another minima here. And they are almost degenerate within experimental uncertainty. Okay? Somehow, this thing that is bouncing 10 to the minus 47 of zero bounces again very, very far away, where we don't even live. Why, we don't know. I'll discuss the implications uh, tomorrow. Okay, thanks. Imaginary time. <laughs> we have imaginary time. For um. Is it, is, it, is it on? It's on, right? Yeah, so um, uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, and um, when you say it's bouncing, like, uh, does this bounce appear in the two loop and three loop corrections? Yes. Uh, but because in the first loop, I think you, it, will, it will only diverge. In the first loop, it, it starts to go up, in fact. It no, starts? it doesn't. So what you really have to do at very, very large fields you have to RG improve this exercise. You cannot keep new fixed. Uh, so okay. what you're really doing is you're solving the renormalization group equation of the couplings. It just so happens that for this theory, all the couplings stay perturbative all the way to extremely high scale. It's just there is a lambda pole for hypercharge, but that's here. Okay. So everything is perturbative. And therefore, the theory, once you take care of this little fact, you cannot hold mu fix. But that's just a technical calculation, organization of the calculation. Everything remains perturbative, so the structure is actually stable. Even at one loop, I think I have, I did the one loop. I can give you the material for this. This is an example of the most important effects that I get at one loop. You can easily do this. So what you have to solve is the, um, you have to integrate for the beta functions of the, of the theory. These are the running couplings of the theory, lambda, y top, and so on, starting from MS bar parameters at uh, around the top mass. So this is how the couplings evolve. All of them remain small. Look, this is log 10 of phi in GV. Planck scale is somewhere over here. So above here, this is gibberish. <laughs> but below, this is OK. You see the instability really hits in much below 10 to the 10 GV, so well before the Planck scale. And even at one loop, Lambda begins to rise above, but it's, it's not under good control. So at two loops, the rise is faster. The instability actually is postponed a little bit, mm. and uh, you go less negative, a little bit less negative. So, but the qualitative structure remains, and, and uh, you seem to go up. So in two loop and three loop, it seems like it gets more stable. A little bit more stable. It's very stable by the time you go to three loops. So the, it's, the theory is really calculable. Okay, so, so maybe higher loops would make it more stable, but it's probably you know, diminishing returns. I can't maybe. prove it, but uh, it, because the calculation hasn't been done, it might be even worth it to do it, I'm not sure. Um, but there is no good reason to think that uh, by the time you go to higher loops, you're going to do better. So you see, over here, everything, all these couplings are very perturbative. Remember, everything comes with yeah. some coupling squares over 4 pi squared. This is how the things enter in the expressions and into, into the calculation. So this theory is really perturbative. It's not a huge surprise that three loop agrees very well with two loops, oh, for okay. example. So there is no good reason that I'm aware of to think that suddenly at six loops things will change. Sorry. But the result might be so important it might be worth looking at it. Yeah, what you would it's be it's more worried the about the boundary of metastability, right? The, the observations you you, sh you, sh you showed so yeah. Yeah, but what you really want to be worried about, and many people were, is maybe some Planck scale physics enters here around, around the, oh, the Planck scale. However, again, at two loop, the instability happens a little bit before, a couple of orders of magnitude before, and so there is a discussion on it. It's not obvious what Planck scale corrections do. Planck scale corrections could, in principle, change this picture a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I see. Okay, thank of, you. Of, of course, new physics could easily revolutionize 
this thing. If you now just add more fermions, vector-like fermions that have some bare mass but have a large Yukawa coupling, for example, you immediately destabilize this picture completely. If you add more scalar fields with some interactions, people ask what singlets, what not, that couple to the standard model Higgs, you could take it either way. If you want the um, fantastic observation, again, an experimental observation is in the standard model, just the minimal standard model, you can do this computation and the, the result just bounces off zero. If, you, if there is, you know, significantly coupled new physics that completely changes this picture, then this is an accident. It could be. Could be that this is just an accident. I find it very interesting. I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Christophe's uh, comments, I think. Just to comment that here you made strong assumption about uh, the neutrino, right? I mean, I, I don't know. I was not there when you, in your derivation. But the way you introduce the neutrino masses can totally change this picture. Absolutely. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say I made strong assumptions. So Christophe made the following point. A as I said, this was the standard model calculation. It's very sensitive to various structures, various interactions of the standard model with the Higgs sector. So the fact that this is the standard model result is undisputed. However, the standard model also says neutrinos are massless. <laughs> so Christophe is saying you have to add new degrees of freedom. What are they going to do to this object if you add degrees of freedom? A very simple, minimal way to add degrees of freedom to the standard model is to take the standard model Higgs age, to take the neutrino fermion doublet L, and to add another gauge singlet. So this would be two half. This is two half in Christoph's uh, SU2 cross uh, U1 hypercharge notation. And this would be one zero, just a sterile neutrino. And just add to the standard model Lagrangian a coupling that looks like, uh, let's call it Y neutrino, HL, contracted in the SU2 indices times N plus CC. If you do this, this object is going to give uh, Dirac masses for neutrinos. This is just one example. And uh, the masses of neutrinos are very small, so this particular, so the mass of neutrino again, in here, the mass of the neutrino would be Y ni times the VEV of the Higgs over square root of 2. And because this number is so small, the y is tiny for Dirac neutrinos, and there will be essentially no effect on the discussion. However, neutrinos might be Majorana, so it's possible if, that you add that, you also add, why don't you also add something like this, mn, nn. N is a Dirac fermion, is, is a Majorana fermion. So why don't you add that? If you do that, so that's a Dirac neutrino, that's a Majorana neutrino. Then now the mass of the neutrino looks like y ni v squared over m squared, the mass of the lighter neutrinos. And now you really don't have control over what y is. If the scale of the mass of neutrinos is low, if it is, for example, a TV, y is pretty big. Right? Yes, y is, y is going to be pretty big. And so. Actually, the opposite. If m is big, y is going to, be, is going to need to be big. So if m is, is at the gut scale, for example, y is going to be big. Gut scale sounds far away, but it's somewhere around here. If y is big, it's going to destabilize the potential even more. So new physics can change these pictures. The details of the mechanism for neutrino mass is one example. Definitely. This is just one example. There are many others. But this example is one that we know we need. We need something like this. Uh, are you going to talk about thermal corrections of this stuff? Yes. Tomorrow? I hope. <laughs> uh, I will ask tomorrow. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Maybe one. Uh, oh. Yes, one. Well, we can also ask because I pushed yes. you too long. We can also you can also postpone questions yeah, so for maybe tomorrow. Maybe postpone uh, for the Q and A. Yeah, the Q and A session. Yes. Sure. I'll uh, remind you that the Q and A will be after the Laura lecture, so the last session. Okay, let's thank Fear again.